right, so the Electoral College. I'm going to talk about that first. Um, then I want to talk about the battleground. These are the states where the election is really decided. Sometimes we call them the, the swing states. Um, these are the, the most competitive states, the small, small subset of states um, where most of the campaign actually unfolds, where, where the candidates spend um, most of the time. And it exists largely because of the uh, Electoral College, though not entirely. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about uh, polarization. Um, everyone knows how, you know, conflictual American politics is uh, these days. Um, whether you're a political commentator or a scholar of, of political science, the, the term we use to describe this is polarization. And I want to talk generally about what we mean by that term, um, how this has been a growing feature of American politics long before Trump came along, actually. Um, and what polarization implies uh, for the outcome of this election in, in particular. And like I've said, that it, that'll be kind of predictably unpredictable. It's been a feature of uh, most recent elections. So if we go to the next slide, let me first say something about um, the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, just click through for all the slides. You can just bring up the okay. points. Um, right. So this is certainly one of the most arcane features uh, of the Constitution and of American politics. Um, but, you know, or I should say on top of that, in addition to being arcane, it's kind of obscured by the actual conduct of the presidential election campaign, which makes it appear as though, as I said, Americans are directly um, choosing their president. But that's not actually what they're doing. So. Uh, the, the, the basic points are, first, that there are 538 electors, 538 people chosen by voters who formally are the ones who cast a vote for president and vice president. Each state has a number of electors equal to the size of their congressional delegation. So that means the number of people they have sitting in the House of Representatives, that's the lower house uh, of Congress. Um, plus uh, there are two senators uh, in the upper house, plus three for the, the District of, uh, of Columbia. So the total of all of that, of the congressional delegations, um, plus DC is 538. Um, and it, it's in fact the members of the Electoral College that people are strictly speaking voting for when they vote during presidential elections. Each party nominates or chooses, I should say, a slate uh, of electors um, that are pledged to the, the candidate of that party. These, you know, people are, are people that the party has confidence will follow through and vote for uh, their party's candidate on election day. These tend to be really long time uh, party activists um, who, who are, are very reliable. Um, but strictly speaking, these are, these are the people who, who vote for uh, the president. Um, in all, uh, in every state except for Nebraska and Maine, uh, all of the votes in that state, all of the electoral votes, are awarded to whoever wins the most votes in the state. So, you know, if you get the most, uh, the largest, uh, your slate uh, has the largest share in a given state, all of that state's electoral votes go to that candidate, even if you win just by, you know, 50% plus one. Um, and as I said, the electors are real people, and they actually meet uh, after the election in their state capitals to formally uh, cast their votes. And then after a long period of time, uh, and uh, at the beginning of January, as everybody now knows, uh, because of the last presidential election, uh, these votes are then transmitted to a uh, joint session of Congress where uh, they're actually certified. And then the the... the Kind of final tally of the vote formally takes place. The one's kind of final little point about this, the composition of the Electoral College, the reason why it's 538 is basically because they had a hard time making up their minds uh, about how to choose a president. It's one of the last things that were decided that was decided at the Constitutional Convention. There was really no president, precedent, I should say, for electing someone like a president uh, at that time. Uh, and so they had to get creative. Ultimately, what they decided to do was to 
kind of import what, what was called the Great Compromise. Um, that is the fact that you have one House of Congress, the House of Representatives, that's decided on the basis of representation by population, and another, the Senate, that is decided on territorial basis, where each state uh, has has a has equal representation. That that sort of compromise for the putting together of the national legislature, that was the central problem uh, at the Constitutional Convention. Once they settled that, they imported it into various parts of the, uh, of the remainder of the Constitution, including this, uh, the Electoral College. So if we look at the, at the next slide, this is what the United States looks like in terms of Electoral College votes, which is not entirely different from how, how the United States looks. Um, except that it makes really small states in population terms uh, kind of look a little larger than they might be. And of course, you know, geographically small states that are large in population terms, quite a bit larger uh, than, they, than they actually are. But you can see California is the biggest, and some of these battleground states we'll talk more about later, uh, Pennsylvania, um, Georgia's in the battleground this time around. Florida and Ohio used to be battleground states. Michigan is, is thought to be a battleground state this time around. Um, those states have significant uh, numbers of electoral votes, which is one of the reasons they spent so much time in them. Can we have a, the next slide? Of course. I just bring up all the points again. Um, this is maybe a little too much detail, but uh, just briefly, uh, why the Electoral College? Um, as I said, you know, there were other alternatives and they did consider direct popular election, which is kind of what the presidential looks like, uh, what the election looks like, that people would directly vote for, um, for candidates. But they decided ultimately this wasn't going to work for a couple of reasons. Um, the biggest one is certainly that smaller states and, you know, and essentially a coalition with the slave owning states um, really were fearful of direct election. Um, they, they feared that their interests would essentially be sacrificed to those of the larger states. And so uh, direct popular election was, was set aside there as it was in the Great Compromise um, for that reason. There also was a, just a kind of, you know, keeping in mind this was the 18th century, it was hard to imagine how you could coordinate the preferences of large numbers of you know, people spread across the sprawling new you know, republic. Um, even if it was just 13 states at that time, still in the 18th century, you know, geographically, it was kind of hard to imagine how they could coordinate on just uh, you know, one candidate uh, directly in a, in, a, in a direct popular election. Um, and so the Electoral College was thought of uh, you know, as a way for the states indirectly to, to shape the outcome and to kind of coordinate or organize this decision problem uh, at a lower level. Um, lastly, the last point here is just that, uh, which I guess I've already said, is that the, you know, the, it's not as though people were making a strong positive argument for the Electoral College. Um, the framers really couldn't come up with anything else. Um, I think they went, they voted through a long sequence of alternatives that were kind of proposed and then failed, and some of them came back. So they, it took them forever. It's one of the last things that was decided at the Constitutional Convention because they didn't you know, they didn't have any good ideas about it. And this was uh, chosen not as something that uh, folks really, you know, the, the, uh, the framers at the Constitutional Convention, it's not something that they, you know, positively favored. It was just the only thing that they could uh, kind of agree on, the only thing they could come up with uh, at the end. So I'm going to let uh, Julia move, move us on to the, to the next slide. So that's just the Electoral College in a kind of really broad strokes. Um, one of the important consequences of the Electoral College is, is the second term that I wanted to talk about, um, which is the, the battleground. And it's, it's so called because this is where all the attention goes in a, a presidential uh, election. Um, so the, the, because of the existence of the Electoral College and of winner take all rules for allocating seats in the Electoral College, Candidates have very little uh, incentive to campaign in uncompetitive states. Um, so, because electoral votes, you know, if, if if my candidate has the largest number of votes, I get or largest number of uh, votes in the election, you know, the, the largest share of the popular vote, I get all the electoral votes. 
uh, as a result, it doesn't matter if you win narrowly uh, you know, or lose narrowly as compared to you know, winning uh, you know, in a dominating way, being completely massacred uh, on election day, the outcome is, is still the same. And so in those states that are you know, very heavily leaning one direction or the other, there's really no rational reason to devote to devote scarce resources. Um, you know, when the winner takes all, there's no reward for a larger victory or a smaller defeat. A win is a win, a loss is a loss. And so candidates don't campaign, even in some of the largest states, like you know, New York, California, Texas is getting an odd degree of attention this time around. Um, and actually, in New York and California, sometimes the presidential candidates do turn up there during uh, the election campaign, but it's not because these states are at all competitive. Both those states are one-sidedly democratic, but it's because those states are where all the money is. Um, so they'll turn up there to, you know, uh, track donations uh, for their for their uh, for their campaign, or because there's other important folks there, but not because the race is actually decided in those states, even though they have a large number of electoral votes. One thing that's worth noting is that states decide, and someone referred to this uh, before we started, states decide how to allocate the votes in the Electoral College. Um, the Constitution uh, and Congress have essentially jointly decided to leave to the states a vast number of decisions about how national elections uh, would be fought. Um, and this is uh, absolutely the case with the Electoral College. Big difference from Canada, where Elections Canada decides for all of us um, on their statutory authority uh, how those elections will, will proceed. Um, nevertheless, 48 of the 50 states do it in the same way, which is winner-take-all rules. Only two quite small states, relatively speaking, Nebraska and Maine, do it differently, and their results don't, don't tend to, to be very, uh, very decisive for outcomes. Um, anyway, the, the, the bottom line is the battleground exists because of the Electoral College and the fact that the electoral votes are allocated based on these winner-take-all rules. Now, if all states were closely fought, if they were all competitive, um, or if the battleground was broadly representative of the United States, maybe it wouldn't make such a difference. Um, but uh, in actual fact, if we can move on to the next slide, uh, many states are spectacularly uh, uncompetitive, um, typically with uh, fewer than 10 states in the battleground. And actually, the battleground has gotten quite a lot smaller uh, over the last uh, 20, 25 years. Uh, this time around, there's basically seven states that we're talking about. I'll say something about that. Uh, in a moment. But you know, in 2020, uh, after all, all it was all said and done, um, there were 33 states plus the District of Columbia that uh, decided that were decided by margins of greater than 10 points, um, whereas there were only eight decided by fewer than five points. Um, and importantly, the fact that these eight, seven or eight states are non-competitive was known well in advance of Election Day. Um, so all along, you know, months, years before uh, campaigns were preparing to concentrate the, their efforts in in those states. Um, I, I just wanted to say that again, you know, it wouldn't perhaps matter so much except for the amount of attention each individual American gets. Uh, it might not matter so much kind of normatively or philosophically that campaigns were concentrated in the battleground, except for the fact that they aren't really a micro microcosm of America. On some dimensions they are, or have tended to be over time, but on one dimension in particular, um, they are not, which is that um, proportionately there are fewer African Americans and Latinos inside than uh, outside the battleground. And that in itself wouldn't matter a whole lot if it wasn't for the fact that racial attitudes, sort of the kind of positions people have on questions concerning racial and, and ethnic equality and politics of immigration, for instance, um, if that wasn't so important to voters' decision making, which not only has it always been to some degree, but it's maybe now more important than ever. So the battleground matters a lot. So let me just say something about, if I can move on to the next slide, something about the battleground in, in 2024. I just grabbed this from the New York Times this morning, and so here we're looking. These are at, all battleground states. These are the the seven battleground states. Um, 
as far as the New York Times is concerned, and the Cook Political Report, which is kind of authoritative. Um, uh, place, especially for, for polling data. Um, and these are obviously races that are very close. So what we're looking at is the Republican and Democrat um, share of uh, vote intention from August uh, right up into the present, as judged by a whole slew of polls across all these states um, over time. Uh, as goes with tradition, Republicans are in red, Democrats blue, of course. That's why we talk about red states and blue states. Um, in any case, all of these states, I mean, we're talking about one point, two points in Arizona, uh, perhaps on average. So these, what these lines, the thick lines do is average uh, the polls for a given moment in time. And, and everywhere, as you can see, the race is tight and it's been pretty much tight throughout uh, the election. So as of today, um, these these seven states uh, are the are the really important ones, um, and and all seven of these Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin they were all battleground states in 2020 as well, all decided by less than three percent of the vote, and in fact Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin back Trump in 2016 and Biden in 2020. So this is really where the game, uh, where the game is, is played. Um, but essentially what we're looking at, the polls are, are deadlocked everywhere. Beyond these seven states, the race is far less competitive, more like, you know, five, six, 10, 20 points separating um, Harris and Trump. Um, one little thing I wanted to note about this, um, just looking at the battleground states here, is that if we assume Harris were to win all the states that are solidly democratic, that are not thought to be uh, in contention at all, and all the states that are clearly leaning in the democratic direction, then Harris just needs Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, and Michigan, um, all of which she, although she's not leading now, she has led in, not by a lot, but has led in uh, for extended periods uh, since she she entered the race. Um, Trump would need at least one of those states uh, and probably uh, all the others um, in order to win. So he, he really can't win without uh, one of those states. And he actually needs more electoral votes. The Democrats have slightly more electoral votes kind of locked up, um, so to speak. Anyway, so that's my comment on the battleground as of this afternoon or this morning.